Legibility and loss in the 19th century archive, and it is essentially, um, it's about, in a sense, about the digital, but it's it, um, only as a kind of background phenomenon, and it's primarily about the interface of the 19th century book. In July of 1879, the aging poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow sat in the study of this historic home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, reading an illustrated book about the American West. It told him an immense, never-melting snowy cross formed in the crevices on the face of the Sawatch Mountain Range in Colorado on a peak known as the Mount of the Holy Cross. The book provided an illustration of the phenomenon by Thomas Moran, reproduced there. For Longfellow, who had never traveled anywhere west of New England, it was nevertheless a moment of recognition. Looking at the image, he was brought in that back to a night of horror exactly 18 years earlier, when in that same parlor, his wife Fanny had burned to death in his arms. She had been in the adjoining library, sealing a lock of their young daughter's hair in an envelope when the hot wax dripped onto her dress and caught fire. Fanny rushed into the parlor, engulfed in flames that Longfellow attempted to extinguish with a small rug and then with his body. He was burned and scarred severely, that's why the beard from then on, and she died the next morning. Now with this picture of the Mount of the Holy Cross before him, he was moved to write his famous sonnet, The Cross of Snow. In the long sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall, where round its head the night lamp casts a halo of pure light, pale light. Here in this room she died, a soul more white, never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose, nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite. There is a mountain in the distant west that sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side, such as the cross I wear upon my breast, these 18 years through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. Seeing the cross of snow, Longfellow feels it in a Dimmesdale-like transfer upon his own breast, where it becomes a symbol of trauma and loss, a kind of typographical dagger indicating Fanny's mortality, symbolic on the page of Longfellow's book and adopted by him as a sign of changeless grief, the permafrost left after tragic bereavement. Yet it is also a negative insignia, a white erasure on black ground that reverses the polarities of the typical X that marks the spot or the black inscriptions on the white page of paper. It is the ghost of a mark. Through it, Fanny's legend, which outstrips those that can be read in books, emerges. The open book becomes a portal to the past, to another life, and also a strange and enigmatic mirror via the symbolic trace therein. Turn the clock back 50 years now, to the late Romantic era and Felicia Hemmons' 1827 poem, The Image in Lava. It too is about an encounter with a negative monument instinct with loss, a record of a fiery trauma etched in rock. In a note, Hemmons describes its subject, the impression of a woman's form with an infant clasped to the bosom found at the uncovering of Herculaneum. That is a concave imprint of these ancient bodies in the weirdly preserved ruins left after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Thou thing of years departed, what ages have gone by since here the mournful seal was set by love and agony. Temple and tower have moldered, empires from earth have passed, and woman's heart hath left to trace those glories to outlast. Oh, I could pass all relics left by the pomps of old to gaze on this rude monument cast in affection's mold. Love, human love, what art thou? Thy print upon the dust outlives the cities of renown wherein the mighty trust. Immortal, O oh, immortal, thou art whose earthly glow hath given these ashes holiness. It must, it must be so. You can feel the poet's urgency here, especially in that last line. This thing of years departed must mean something. This print upon the dust must speak of its own holiness as a shrine to maternal love in the face of loss. Hemmons never saw this rude monument, but she read about it most likely in Nathaniel Carter's letters from Europe, which speak of seeing at Pompeii the remains, quote, of a female and a child supposed to be a mother who sat down here with her babe and was overtaken by the storm. Hemmons uses the word overtaken in the poem, which suggests that to me. Like Longfellow lingering over the Thomas Moran illustration in his book, Hemmons encounters this haunting monument via the mediations of print. Indeed, both poems model a certain kind of reading practice, a process of imaginative appropriation and identification. Hemmons' mother had died just months before she wrote The Image in Lava. Reading about trace left by a mother and child in Pompeii, Hemmons engages in a kind of sentimental fill, expanding the reference through an intense investment of personal emotion and imaginative elaboration. 
In so doing, she makes this print upon the dust refer to her own concerns and her own losses, like Longfellow, who makes a crevice in the granite face of a mountain record Fanny's death, filling it with his own grief, just as it has been filled in to become a cross of snow. In 1846, a young woman named Ellen Pierpont wrote her name in a new copy of the poetical works of Mrs. Felicia Hemmons, published in Philadelphia by Grigg and Elliot. She was 18 years old, the youngest child of Hezekiah and Anna Constable Pierpont, part of the wealthy and influential family that essentially built modern Brooklyn. Her book is now in the general circulating collection of Alderman Library at the University of Virginia, where I teach, once it came via her granddaughter exactly 100 years later. The book carries various annotations made in pencil by Ellen, mostly check marks and lines indicating favorite poems and passages. Most striking, however, is the inscription on the rear free end paper, again written in pencil in Ellen's hand. Sing mournfully, sing mournfully, our dearly loved is gone, the gifted and the beautiful is from our sight withdrawn. Then let us sing her requiem now in this our parting hour, and softly breathe her name who was our fairest, loveliest flower, Mary, Mary, Mary. Apparently composed in 1862, that is 16 years later than the first inscription, these lines were written by Ellen, now Mrs. Minor, for her third daughter, Mary Montague Minor, who was born in 1855 and died at the age of seven. In this halting yet moving pastiche of Hemmons' own style, adapting lines from the Nightingale's death song and the burial of an immigrant's child in the forest, Mrs. Minor has transformed her copy of Hemmons into a memorial site, also into a collaborative anthology, marked at the hour of parting. Like a family Bible, the book bears witnesses to, witness to stages and losses across many years, and like a source book of feeling, it seems to have offered an idiom to its owner, having lost her child, as Amy Hempel puts it, fluent now in the language of grief. I found this book in the library stacks, and as I gazed on it, it seemed in a certain way to become the image in lava, a thing of years departed, a rude monument, again bearing witness to maternal loss. Now, the Grigg and Elliot editions of Hemmons are legion. The book was stereotyped in 1836, and it was reprinted almost annually for decades. It became perhaps the most common and affordable collected Hemmons for 19th century Americans. The University of Virginia holds more than one copy, and another one, from a few years earlier, 1839, is inscribed to Charlotte M. Cock from a friend, Christmas 1840, and it has very few annotations, only a handful of marked passages across its 559 pages, except for one page, the one containing the poem, The Graves of a Household. Multiple underlinings, brackets, check marks, and exclamation points erupt across the text of this poem, culminating in the third stanza, which reads, one midst the forest of the west, by a dark stream is laid, the Indian knows his place of rest far in the cedar shade. Next to these lines, Miss Charlotte, now Mrs. Gordon, has written, My darling William died December 29, 1879. And at the bottom of the page, she has written one word, I think in response to the Hemmings' conclusion of the poem, Alas, for love, if thou wert all, and not beyond, O earth. That one word is no. Like Ellen Pierpont, Charlotte Cott received her copy of Hemmings when she was young and unmarried. Charlotte was 22, Ellen was 18 and turned to it much later as a mother to mourn the loss of a child. William Fitzhugh Gordon, Charlotte's sixth child, died at the age of 28 in Texas by the dark streams of the West, exactly 39 Christmases after Charlotte first received her Hemmings book as a gift. In both copies, Hemmings' poetry has become a touchstone for personal grief, and the books themselves have taken on this quasi-memorial character marked and revisited across the years. I find it striking that two copies of this edition of Hemmings in one library collection would have been marked in such a, and annotated in such a similar way, and it suggests to me that there was something about this bibliographic format, this time period, this author, and this class of reader that encouraged such a response. In considering these annotated copies, one is reminded of Hemmings' sonnet to a family Bible, where she muses, what, house, what household thoughts around thee as their shrine cling reverently, O book of heaven with grateful tears, I pour heart blessings on the holy dead and thee. Like the collected Hemmings, the good book becomes a touchstone, equally important for its ability to call up personal memories and household thoughts of the holy dead as it is for any specific content. In the case of Ellen Miner's Elegy for Little Mary, we see written evidence of this phenomenon, and Charlotte Cott Gordon's tremor of recognition as she encounters the graves of a household can be observed in her annotations. Hemmings' one midst the forest of the West can be the one that a reader needs it to be. For the elderly Mrs. Gordon, it was for William, buried somewhere in Texas, far from her Virginia hearth and home in Esmont, in now Mark County. Now I begin with these vignettes because I'm going to talk today about marks in books, and particularly about the personal appropriations associated with 19th century markup language. And I want to argue that it's not yet well understood what a 19th century book was, either as an object in isolation or as a fully embedded nexus of culture 
shaped by myriad forces in its production and its ongoing reception. Essentially, I'm interested in books as processive objects, multiply marked and coded via their relationships to human beings as interfaces and as platforms. Indeed, in a very real sense, we'll never fully know what books as fusions of textual and physical materials meant to their 19th century readers. However, by framing the issue in this way, I hope to re reassert the dependence of book history and indeed literary history on individual copies and the evidence they bear as scenes of encounter. At the same time, Longfellow's Cross of Snow and Hemmings' Image in Lava suggest to me the undertone of loss that often, that often haunts our encounters with books, just as it colors the enterprise of recovery of the past, Benjamin's angel of history. We're left with crosses, erasures, curious marks, deracinated objects, occasionally legible inscriptions, out of which we may begin to construct a history of readers and their 19th century books. That history is by its nature anecdotal, its forensic base incomplete, and its methods tied inextricably to the romance of the trace. Today I'm going to present some case studies of bookmarking that trace the losses of the past and thus evoke the lost world of 19th century book use. And at the same time, I'm going to spend some time sounding a note of warning regarding another impending loss, that is the uncertain future of our global 19th century library collections in the wake of wide-scale digitization. And I'm going to argue that scholars need now to make the case for physical library collections amid the new information ecology and the massive remediation of the historical record, which is ongoing, even as they adopt digital technologies to help make that case. And it turns out that the 19th century is at the very center of these negotiations. So each Tuesday, or sorry, Thursday, each Thursday for the past few years, a large North American van lines moving truck has pulled up to the loading dock of Alderman Library at the University of Virginia and gathered into itself rolling shelves full of books. Drawn from the circulating collections and well padded for their journey, these books are headed in their ranks for the Google scanning facility, where they're to be digitized and added to the growing Google Book Search Library. This is by now a familiar story with similar events occurring simultaneously at, most, at many major academic research libraries in the US and in Europe. You're not supposed to be looking at these pictures. Google doesn't like any, anyone to know what their process is, but I walked by and took them, so you get to see. Um, it's all copy. It's all like patented or copyrighted or something. Um, anyway. As of last year, Google has scanned more than 15 million of the estimated 130 million books in the libraries of the world, and their trucks keep rolling. Although we can talk about that, there's some indication now that they may be slowing down, and may be sort of giving up on the, the rest. It's just too expensive. But anyway, already a powerful resource has emerged for searching, reading, and statistical analysis of printed books. And it seems we are, or soon will be, in an extraordinarily stronger position to study 19th century culture via its published global record. We're probably all doing that already, <coughs> using Google Books to amp up our research in various ways. And to write new English literary histories based on digital searches, collections, and interventions of various kinds. We talked a lot about this yesterday. Yet the status of the 19th century book within this changing system is particularly conflicted out of copyright, that's important, and well represented within the circulating collections of university libraries, books printed during the Victorian era in particular are becoming rapidly available in full text via Google. These books return to Alderman Library on the same trucks each week, but their journey to the scanning facility has placed them on a different footing within the library and within the system of, circuit, within the system of circulation and preservation that enables their existence. In short, they are now in a kind of competition with their own surrogates. The resulting effects may be unpredictable, but as Anthony Grafton has put it, a strange kind of war is being waged in academic research library circles between the traditional idea of the library as a physical repository and research space and the emerging concept of the library as a virtual data center and an access port. Our international collections of 19th century material, plentiful, various, out of copyright, often fragile due to poor paper and hard use, are at the epicenter of such a war. We're now at the end of the 150-year cycle to produce such collections in the first place, from the printing of the books after the 1830s primarily to their acquisition by research libraries as collections got built through the 20th century, frequently via bequests from the grandchildren of the book's original owners. What will be the contours of this archive as it emerges from the coming decade of digitization? What will the 19th century look like with 2020 vision? The question really can only be answered as a function of the evidence of human culture, human interaction, human emotion, and human histories that the archive can be said to possess or illuminate. Even as the 19th century printed record was being produced, people were overwhelmed by its sheer scale. And ever since, we have a necessity relied on partial reading, specialized attention, representative sampling for our interpretations of the cultures that produced it. Yet now, with the advent of multi-million text repositories such as Google Books Corpus or the HathiTrust Digital Library, or more specifically and for a fee, ProQuest C19 database, 23 million 19th century items, 
or Gail Cengage's ambitious new 19th century collections online, Necco, it hasn't been released yet, but it's going to dwarf Echo, if you've used Echo, Necco is the next big thing. We're in a position, or soon will be, to revise exponentially upward the number of texts we can bring to bear on our hypotheses. Algorithmic searching and text mining can guide us towards new patterns and connections that are only visible through the power of digital processing. Yet it must be remembered that this mode of research focuses almost exclusively on the verbal content of idealized models of 19th century printed materials, models that are themselves often vitiated by numerous localized errors in character recognition. And Charlotte Covich talked about that last night. We can learn a lot about historical discourse through keyword searching and algorithmic processes, or at least we can be pointed in a lot of promising directions for further reading. But to understand the complex meaningfulness of 19th century literature and its social human character, we have to attend to the interface, which includes both the hardware of the physical book and the software of the many processes shaping its material forms and formats in the historical frame of reference. The 19th century book called forth many, many kinds of interaction between texts and their readers, between books and other objects, between human bodies and other human bodies. We tend to think of the history of reading as centered in the consumption of verbal texts, but I want us to encourage us to go beyond texts as linguistic forms and think about texts as something closer to textiles, woven creation of material and semantic content. That is, as a historical record that is always already incarnated, each body bearing traces of its many social interactions and its long journey into our hands. Piercings, perhaps, as in the sewing needle stuck in an 1860 copy of Hannah Moore's Letters to Macaulay, formerly owned by one Lucy Nelson who wrote in the book that it was brought me by sister from Baltimore, September 1860. People left things behind in their books, pieces of their lives and even of themselves. For example, this lock of silver hair found between the pages of a library copy of the works of Lord Byron, published in Philadelphia in 1851, formerly owned by Neil Heilman. The lock lies next to the Ave Maria stanzas of Don Juan Canto III. And I'll just say that every image I'm going to show today is from the circulating collection of my university library. These are not rare books. You can check these all out and take them. And I did. <laughs> this, this Latinx image is an exception. Um, because it, this brings me back for a moment to Fanny Longfellow, whose death was caused as she tried to preserve her child's lock of hair, and from whose, from whose head Longfellow clipped this tress on the day of her death, July 10, 1861. It's now in the Houghton Library, a rare books room, in an envelope dated by Longfellow himself in a shaky, grief stricken hand. We don't know the owner or the preserver of this silver gray, gray lock in the 1851 Byron but it nevertheless gestures towards a similar web of human affection and the curiously fragile permanence of the human body. In other books, we find other human traces, like this one of a hand, probably former owner John McSparrens in an 1825 copy of Burns's poetry, facing an original poem about Burns written in 1851. You can't quite read there. Or to take one more example, this traced hand on the rear free end paper of an 1853 copy of the works of William Shakespeare, with schoolgirl Miriam Trowbridge's inscription, Ruthie Whitehead's ugly hand, Oh no, I mean beautiful one. She's teasing her friend with that picture. This is a Victorian book literally bearing the trace of a Victorian hand, a nice metaphorical illustration of the processes by which books get marked with bodies and tools as they make their way to our libraries for study. Many of us have by now seen similar interventions in Google book scans. Here the hand of the scanning agent captured unwittingly in a page shot of a mid-Victorian novel of the same vintage as the schoolgirl Shakespeare volume. The image of the hand in the 19th century book, John McSparren's, Ruthie Whitehead's, and the Google scanners, makes visible the somatic, indeed the explicitly haptic process of reading, calling us to attend to the historical book as a physical and social interface, even as it suggests the presence that remains within or even haunts books as they move through time. A random collection of 19th century books of literature taken from the circulating stacks at Alderman Library at the University of Virginia reveals that these are several examples, these several examples I've shown are part of a much larger archive of the history of reading hidden in plain sight on the shelves of academic research libraries. And I'm just gonna silently flip through about some of these, maybe 20 of these, with, and then I'll move on. But I, it's better to kind of immerse and sort of see what I'm talking about rather than the kind of cherry-picked cherry one. Again, these are all just um, things that are on the shelves um, in the circulating collection. says Byron was a bad man.
post environment. Some of these are more legible than others, some are more evocative, and some are more banal. And there's a lot more. These are just ones that I sort of randomly threw up there. Yet because they're part of a library collection with a history, that is, they come from a finite set of donors, each of whom left a paper trail, and all of whom have some collect connection to the area and to the university, they can in part be traced and unfolded as part of the 19th century culture of consumption of the book. Indeed, with the rise of large-scale digital text searching, we can now more easily make connections particularly if we can tie names and dates to annotations and life events. And we're particularly interested in the time and date stamped kinds of notes that people, the kind of journaling that they do in the books. Um, those, those stand out for me. Um, in this way, the global digital library is enabling us to see further into the past. Such examples as I've shown here suggest that similar and related examples of marking are out there on the shelves of our library, waiting to be found and to illuminate our understanding of 19th century literature and culture that produced, and the culture that produced and consumed it. However, they give us, oh, sorry, moreover, they give us our only way back into the modality of book use that was true, inseparably twinned, double helix fashion with the reading practices of the past. It's how people used books and how people read. Can't really separate those two. Trying to work on 19th century literature without these marked pieces of technology is a bit trying, like trying to work on software without knowing anything about the hardware platform for which it was designed. It can only get you so far. But what is the future of this printed material, and specifically of the general collections of 19th century books in academic research libraries in the wake of wide-scale digitization? As I've said, the question has particular urgency for scholars who work on materials from the long 19th century. In most cases, pre-1800 books have been moved to special collections. There are examples, there are exceptions to that, um, but in most cases it's true, um, the vast majority. And post-1923 materials remain in copyright, and thus they have to be on the shelves for circulation. They can't be scanned and stuff up freely. The remainder, that is the printed archive of the long 19th century, stands vulnerable as college and university libraries increasingly reconfigure access to public domain texts via repositories such as Google Books and the Hottie Trust Digital Library. And I don't know if your library catalog does this yet, but ours, you, you pull up a hit and it'll, you can either look for it in the stacks or it'll say go here for the Google, click the here for the Google copy, click here for the Hottie Trust copy. It's obviously much easier to do that than it is to pull yourself off the stacks to, to find the one you want. So in January of this year, the OCLC, that's the Online Computer Library Center, they're the ones that run WorldCat, pretty heavy hitters, they released a report written by Constance Malthus entitled Cloud Sourcing Research Collections Managing Print in the Mass Digitized Library Environment. This report focuses primarily on the Hadi Trust Digital Library, and I can tell you more, well, we'll talk a little bit about the Hadi Trust if you want, as a potential source for academic research library collections. Composed primarily of the library contributed content from the Google Books project, the Hadi Trust is a consolidated digital repository that includes approximately two million public domain volumes. And as Malthus states, one of the hypotheses that this study set out to test is that the Hadi Trust digital library represents a potentially rich source of digital surrogates that might over time effectively replace a substantial proportion of low use print collections in academic libraries. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the report finds that yes, the replacement of low use print collections with how do you trust surrogates makes a lot of sense. Malpas concludes that it is in the interest of all academic libraries that mass digitized collections improve to the degree that low use print inventory can be retired in favor of increased reliance on digital surrogates. Such recommendations from leading policymakers and academic library communities suggest the seriousness of the challenge to public domain print collections in the coming decade. And they also show how far academic librarianship has moved away from allegiance to the local collections in favor of access-driven models, and in that move they've been driven by us, by patron use and deals. Other library policy organizations have produced similar or related visions of the academic research library's digital future. In September 2009, an Ithaca strategy and research report appeared, written by Roger Schoenfeld and Ross Hausrey, with the ominous title, What to Withdraw, and subtitled, Print Collections Management in the Wake of Digitization. The word management, if you look, that's the same one now, just use managing print, it means downtime. Efficiency is a print. Recently merged, now Ithaca recently merged with JSTOR to provide access to scholarly journals online, made the case that university libraries should start deaccessioning collections of print journals and rely solely on the digital versions. Quote, the large scale digitization of print journal collections has led to most access needs being met via digital surrogates. Numerous libraries would therefore like to reassign the space occupied by print collections towards higher value uses. 
And although the recommendations here are ostensibly confined to journals only, the language of the report encourages a slide towards print collections generally. The logic seems to apply, saying things like, we do not assume that there is any intrinsic value to the maintenance of collections of print artifacts, but rather take a critical perspective to analyze why the community would want to keep any print at all. Furthermore, the Ithaca report displays a troubling attitude towards faculty, faculty resistance to deaccessioning, lamenting, quote, the risk that faculty will protest the removal of even the most rarely used print collections inhibits decision making about print collections. However, they note hopefully, due to a decline in faculty interest in print preservation, both locally and remotely in recent years, the political necessity of maintaining even remote access to print collections will probably remain a requirement only in the medium term. Perhaps most worrisome here are the ideas that the faculty serves only as a temporary inhibiting presence on library policy making, <laughs> and that maintaining print collections is a political requirement, not an essential component of the mission of the academic research library in the first place. In a 2001 report, the evidence in hand, Stephen G. Nichols and Abby Smith of the Council on Library and Information Resources, that's clear, take a more generous view of faculty involvement in the library decision making, but they do warn, quote, scholars may not see preservation of research collections as their responsibility. But until they do, there is a risk that many valuable research sources will not be preserved. The same report concludes that, quote, it is not too early to plan for the eventual disposition of the scores or even hundreds of duplicate copies of individual items that scholars voting with mouse clicks prefer to use online. Of course, what counts as a duplicate copy or indeed an artifact should be the subject of much debate, as I think some of these examples here show. In the absence of scholars' input, librarians will necessarily make these decisions based on oversimplifications. It has the same mark record, it's duplicate. Right? Malpas opines in the OCLC report, popular titles like Defoe's, Robinson Crusoe, or Swift's Gulliver's Travels are each represented by hundreds of digitized versions in the Honey Trust Digital Library. Therefore, the long-term preservation of the intellectual work embodied in these manifestations is, to coin a phrase, virtually guaranteed. We won't lose the literary work. We won't lose Gulliver's travel. To me, that statement reveals a deeply impoverished understanding of the printed record and its wide and meaningful variations, or even basic bibliography, um, and it suggests that inadequate principles of redundant or duplicate copies are going to be employed when we're culling the collections. Now, of course, librarians have always weeded the stacks. Professional deaccessioning is part of the process of maintaining a healthy library system. But what we're facing now is a much larger and much more sudden transformation. The movement of circulating collections to off-site storage is now standard practice at many academic research libraries, and that is going to continue and speed up. Now regional and even national repositories for little-used print collections are being envisioned and implemented. Um, recap in, in, um, in uh, the Northeast, in New York, it's like Princeton, MIPL, a couple other, Columbia. Instead of all, each having their own repository, they have one. They get rid of the other two, and they just keep one, one copy. The idea of a network of a small number of national repositories has been widely suggested in the United States as the next stage in this process. Maybe we just have five big ones that we can all draw on because people aren't really using the print much anyway. Um, that would mean wide sharing and many fewer printed books held. How many copies of the Grieg and Elliot Hemmons will we really need as a nation? 20, 10, 5? Cue the widespread deaccessioning of public domain books. As students and researchers visit the stacks less frequently and demand ever greater digital access to materials, Libraries are under increasing pressure to justify money spent on their print holdings. Books, and especially 19th century books printed on poor paper, are expensive to shelve, preserve, and circulate. A few people are using them, and no one's making a convincing case for their retention. Budgetary pressures, especially the mushrooming expenses associated with providing digital access to materials, or those databases that Charlotte showed us last night, will inevitably force many of the physical books off the shelf. As the director of the digital scholarly organization NIMES, that's the Networked Infrastructure for 19th Century Electronic Scholarship at UVA, I work daily with projects involved in digitizing the historical record of the great age of industrial printing. That's what we all do. And our collective goal is to open up these materials to various kinds of search, discovery, visualization, commentary, contextualization, collaborative research. At the same time, NIMES has always stressed that such digital archives are not replacements for the material texts they represent. Rather, they are simulations or models, close relatives of the traditional scholarly edition. The books on the shelves carry plenty of information lost in the process of digitization, no matter how lovingly one particular copy is rendered for the screen. And in the case of Google Books and Hadi Trust, the emphasis has been squarely placed on quantity over quality. If our academic research libraries replace large swaths of their original 19th century artifacts with these hastily executed single copy scans, They'll be trading away irreplaceable legacies and gutting certain disciplines that rely on the evidence of the past. 
They'll also be putting the real world of the historical book ever further out of the reach of our students, even as they're ostensibly providing access to it via surrogates. In such a future, 19th century books will be simultaneously instantly accessible and almost entirely out of reach, displayed and untouched, so that as things of paper and ink, they will be even more difficult to remember or rediscover than things truly forgotten. As libraries reconfigure their collections, scholars need to participate in the decisions that determine the digital rendering of the surrogates and the resulting library policies at scale. Yet there's a deeper issue on the table here, and I don't want this, I don't want the, you to remember marginalia as the only thing that matters. Marginalia is an example of what I'm talking about, a particularly obvious example of the way books vary. There are other ones that are invisible to us now, but would only be visible if you compared a whole bunch of different copies. Marginalia is easily, easy to see. We don't know what information or evidence the books contain, and any attempt to translate them into digital formats via one representative copy, one presumptively representative copy, particularly at scale and from a distance, will inevitably, inevitably produce losses. This is true not only for individual titles, but for the entire bibliographic system and its historical complexity. That is, many meaningful features of books can only be understood within the larger context of their making and use as reflections of a set of, set of systems of practice, of technologies, of economics, of social behaviors that shape those products of culture. The books themselves are not merely reports on the 19th century. They are individual 19th century scenes of evidence produced, conveyed, sold, handled, read, and marked by the culture of study. This archive of the history of the making and consumption of books cannot be replaced by single copy scans, and new scholars of the historical record cannot be trained on simulations. The study of books quickly reveals that such, such, uh, such objects are extremely complex, both as products of the material and social processes and as platforms upon which readers elaborated their own identities. As my example suggests, 19th century books became sites of mourning, objects for interchange, appropriation, and memorialization in ways that left traces we can sometimes still read. Much more work remains to be done on this aspect of the Victorian book. The intersection of its content with its physical structures and evidence of use as ultimately productive of various layers of meaning, not only for individual works and for our understanding of the cultural field generated by certain authors, but for the larger scene of Victorian reading practices involving emotional investment and identity formation. Put that a different way, I'm asking us to think about 19th century books as objects of love. And so let me return for a moment to Longfellow as a kind of coda here. Another volume in Alderman Library on the shelves, a brittle and poorly printed copy of Longfellow's Poems and Ballads, printed in New York, 1891. And it bears the following note written in pencil by its former owner, Jane Chapman Slaughter, on the front free end paper. Our readings together were in this book, ere you went to your life of work and sacrifice, and I remained to my life of infinite yearning for your presence, the sound of your voice, a yearning never to be satisfied in this world or the next. Now never I see thee, now never more hear the voice of my comrade ever more dear, and he never came back. A number of the poems in this copy bear Jane Slaughter's annotations with explicit reference to her memories of reading them, apparently with John H. Adamson, whose name is also inscribed in the book as its first owner. For example, in the bottom margin after the skeleton in armor, which is Longfellow's ballad in which a ghostly Viking tells the story of winning the love of a blue-eyed maid through storytelling, sort of a fellow like thing. Jane has written in a note, then you looked at your watch and said, now shall we go and make that visit, for at five o'clock I have to go to Washington, and we meant you and I, and we had a happy walk. And then in a later hand on the following page, she has added, our last walk together in this world, never to see each other more, never, oh never, it was after this I called you Norseman, the name we always used to the end in our letters. Do you remember? You added to it your Norseman and your devoted Norseman. In the Longfellow poem, the Viking warrior inspires the maiden's love through storytelling. Once, as I told in glee, tales of the stormy sea, soft eyes did gaze on me, burning yet tender. Lines that we can imagine formed an echo to what was happening with these Victorian lovers. As John read the lines aloud, James Marginalia tells us quite precisely at 10 p.m. on Sunday, July 1st, 1900, in the parlor of the Alexandria Infirmary in Virginia. Jane also notes in the margin of this poem, you read this and I said it just suits your voice. Similarly, above Longfellow's poem, Footsteps of Angels, Jane wrote in 1900, you read this July 1st, Sunday, the day you said goodbye, sitting in the great armchair in the infirmary parlor, oh, friend of mine. And then in the later hand, she has added, once mine, now mine, no more. One more example. At the end of Longfellow's translation of the Copla de Manrique, Jane's note, Sunday, May 6th, nuble pa. And then in Jane's later hand, read to me by my Norseman, oh, so long ago, before he went on his crusade in Liberia 
at Cape Town on the west coast. Now, Cape Town isn't in Liberia. I think she's misremembering Cape Mount. There was a St. John's Episcopal Mission was there, and the Alexandria Infirmary was closely tied to the Episcopal Church. My guess is that this is the older Jane coming back to this book, slightly miss, slightly wobbly on exactly where John was. Precious as a shared object and source, this Longfellow book gets marked twice, first as a private message to an absent lover, and then some years later as an unsent letter to one who has been truly lost. That is, the first annotations made in 1900, just after John's departure, seem to have been meant for him to see when he returned from his travels. We read this together, do you remember? The second ones are addressed to his ghost, still asking the same question. Jane Slaughter never married. She was one of the first women to receive a PhD from the University of Virginia in Romance Languages and her books were given to the UVA library in the 1950s after she in turn passed away. This is a self-portrait of her drawn when she was about 18. That's in special collection. Like the other books I have surveyed here, her copy of Longfellow has come down to us as a nexus of human investments that is in part the business of the humanities to trace. Further, these annotations lead us to re-encounter Longfellow's poetry as part of such nuanced scenes of exchange and identity formation, giving us new purchase on the history of 19th century reading as well as on the interpretation of the poems themselves. The evidence I've shown you today suggests that Victorian readers cherished such volumes as layered social and domestic objects. They found themselves and their own lost children, parents, and partners in those books. And in turn, the books were transformed into deep, sometimes legible souvenirs through the strength of human love. And out of such essentially domestic circles, some of these books have come down to us as common property, bequeathed to universities and public institutions, and made available to readers and scholars. Our role as the interpreters of the resulting archive both demands preservation and depends upon access, and both of those terms are experiencing fundamental shifts under the influence of wide-scale digitization. A massive horizon of opportunity is now opening for humanists to trace the history of language, of ideas, of books, and of reading via automated searches and at visualizations of the global digital library. As I've said, much of my own research for this paper was only made reasonably possible via digital searches of large repositories of texts, particularly genealogical information which allows me to find out who these people were. Yet individual copies of books are under a general downward pressure in this new dispensation. To be effective, the case for the retention of 19th century printed books in academic research libraries cannot take the form of general laments or of calls to save everything. I've tried both of those strategies, but not. <laughs> Rather, academic library policy makers should work closely with scholars who specialize in the history of the 19th century book recognizing that this particular set of materials, published roughly from 1800 to 1923, is under threat given the rise of digitized public domain texts. We're going to have to curate this stuff somehow. We're going to have to know about it. But such groups will have to form and move quickly. Library policies are changing right now. And in a decade or two, it will be all be over, as the wide-scale reliance of digi on digitized surrogates pushes the pu public domain physical collections to the margins or out of the libraries completely. And indeed, that's ongoing in terms of off-site storage. The question is how long we continue to pay for off-site storage and warehousing when no one is using them and people are less likely to use them when they're off-site, much less likely. Um, digitized archives will reveal wonders, indeed they're already doing so. But now, in concert with the digital transformation of the archive, we must also give sustained attention to the material record of the 19th century in its multi-form actuality. And we must demonstrate the value of these specific pieces of historical evidence that taken together constitute the only 19th century that we latecomers can ever know. Thank you. I'd be happy to have questions or comments. Yeah. Thoughts? Yes. Thanks so much. That was, you know, I, I never thought that a paper about digitization would be so moving. <laughs> it's a really, really just, I, I thanks so much Thank for that. Um, I, I was wondering what, perhaps because you ended with a sort of kind of call to arms, yes. maybe. Um, is there anything graduate students can be doing specifically? Since, I, you know, I'm not in any position to sure. be making recommendations, perhaps. To, right, like, I mean, there's, there's, there's bottom-up and there's top-down. I mean, yeah, it's great if you can sit at the table with uh, you know, the, the policymakers, but that's a lot harder. I actually think, in terms of local practice, is the way we, I mean, we need to, um, if we can, if, we, if, if you care, and, and you may not, but if you do, um, we need to get our students in the library. Mm -hmm. We need to come up with assignments that make this stuff, you know, live for them. Um, so that's something that's easy, in a sense. It's like just sort of how often do your students actually need to go and grab a bunch of 19th century books and bring them into class and let's just talk about them. So insofar as we integrate, kind of, it doesn't have to be hardcore bibliographic studies, but some kind of 
uh, sensitivity to book history, and it can be about the history of media. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, dry as dust scholarship. Just sort of let's talk about media format, platform interface, network processes that these objects represent. Insofar as we're using the books, they're less likely to go away because a lot of deaccessioning is done based simply on data. Um, how when was the last time this stuff was touched? Um, and if it's been touched recently, it's more likely to stay there. I've often thought about, I mean, I fantasize about um, gorilla, a guerrilla librarian group, a sort of guerrilla library group. I sort of joke with my grad students, like, we'll each go in every day and check out 10 books. We'll do it quietly, we won't raise a fuss, but we'll just check out 10 books over and over and over. And if we have 50 of us doing it, we could check out, we could turn the entire 19th century collection over, and that might do something. Um, the other is, I mean, there's more wicked things you could do, which is that when they put things off-site, I'm not recommending you do this, by the way. But when they put stuff in off-site storage, they're betting that you will not, they will not frequently be called back because it costs a lot of money to go get that book. It costs like $40 or something, maybe not, but $20 or something to go get that book out of, out of storage. The, you know, so if you made a lot of calls to this, you know, that would basically force the library to be like, what are we doing? What's going on? You know, we thought we made a bad move. We put all this stuff out of the library, and actually this stuff, so would they move it back? Would it start a conversation? Would it be, you know, other, you know, so I mean, there's different kinds of activism, but I do think the most rational one is finding ways to explain to your colleagues, to your students, in your own research or in your own teaching, why these books matter. They may not matter for all of us. I think there's going to be large swaths of our profession for whom this talk doesn't cut any ice, um, because they do what they do with paperbacks and, and, and you know, secondary criticism, and you don't really need a material object. Um, but insofar, if this talk does resonate with you, those of us who do have a feeling for media and for technology and for material um, need to kind of get energized and activated and recognize that this is a kind of crucial hinge moment where the more we can integrate this stuff into our work and make public calls for it, for its relevance. Um, and they can't just be sentimental. So this is the problem with this paper. It's moving, right? But I do that on purpose because I'm trying to get people's attention that it's a lot easier to start talking about burning women and dead babies than it is about different bindings. Right? Bit small variants in the typography. You start talking about that, everyone's asleep on the floor. But if you, if you, if you appeal to the, if you work with the sentimental, the people are like, I get this, this is a human object, uh, we need to preserve this. But it, you can't simply make a sentimental call and say, isn't this stuff all, because babies died all the time. You know, one more dead baby in the 19th century, oh hum. But it, it's meant to be a kind of metaphor for the ways these books are sort of multiply marked and coded and, and relevant. And, but, but, you know, do you know what I mean? The sentimentality issue, I, I still, I'm trying to work that out in this piece. To what extent is that a driver? To what extent am I, I want, I want to inhabit that position for a while here. That is, I, I'm consciously trying to inhabit, because that's what I'm trying to get at, is sentimental reading practices. I mean, that's really what's going on here. And so to try to get in the inner standing point on that is part of the, the exercise here. But how that relates to the policy claim, I think it has to be broader than that. Um, or, or just sort of, you know, more various than, than simply this stuff is. Yeah. You said that, you, I mean, it, it boils down to you have to make a cut somewhere. You can't yeah. preserve all the books that were published, or at least the research libraries that you have, that, that their collections. So what, what are some of the things that you look for? I'm not very familiar with book history. So what are like the signature traits that obviously variances in the right. printing? Yeah. What are some of the uh, maybe bindings you Well, it's interesting. Do? I mean, some uh, those are. I've been now, I've sort of gone public with this idea and have librarians contact me and they're like, can you come and give us some guidelines about what we should get rid of or not? But I mean, in a certain way, I probably will end up doing that. But in a certain way, I'm trying to resist it because I'm like, the point is, I don't know. You know, we don't know what information, the, the, all this marginalia has been invisible for 100 years. No one's ever seen it before. It was there all along. But until I pulled it off the shelf and showed it to you, it was invisible. It was part of a book that no one would ever notice. And in fact, when I talk to preservation people, they're like, well, that's funny. When we see markings in books, we erase them. Because that's damage. Because there are a lot of student markings in books as well. And so it all was just sort of seen as, this is a, a, a less valuable book. It's less useful for our collection because someone's written in it. And no one distinguished between student marks like Foucault, or whatever, I mean, got my ballpoint, and this kind of stuff. And so, but it, so it's almost like, it, it's not that it's um, imperceptible, but we don't perceive it. And so that's my fear is that if I make decisions based on our own current horizon of knowledge about which 19th century books are worth saving and which ones aren't, I may, I'm clearly wearing blinders of all kinds and I might not see things that might be valuable. That happens, that's the story of history, right? The material stuff. And the other thing is um, technology is changing to such a degree that 
Um, you want the originals because we may eventually have tools that can tell us things about these physical objects that you can't use on the scans. I mean, an analogy would be like mummies or something like that. I mean, now we can do all these infrared MRI scans. You know, think of all the stuff you can do with a mummy now that you couldn't do in the 1880s. If you had said, well, okay, let's just take a bunch of photos, really high quality, and then rebury them or, or burn them or something, we don't need them anymore. Then we'd have been like, why did, why did we do that? We, we had the actual mummy, and now we have all this complex technology, we can't do anything. So um, part, part of me resists making decisions based on our current horizon of knowledge. At the same time, I do recognize a need for triage. Um, and making some kinds of choices because it's clearly this, it's clear that this is happening, and so what is the ideal solution? You can't just say, "Look, everybody, keep everything and leave it inert on the shelf because no one's using it." But the, nevertheless, I'm telling you to keep it. That really doesn't cut any ice. You have to somehow say, "How can we, as a group, as a community, as a profession, begin to examine and sort this material and make it come alive in the way that these little pieces do when you look at them closely?" So there's all sorts of ways that books can, could be significant, but a lot of times you don't know until you've seen a bunch of them. So picking up one copy of a book, you're like, okay, what is, what is this thing? Well, you don't know until you've seen 20 other copies, right, usually, particularly in the 19th century. Because until, and 20 usually isn't enough, actually. Some of you may need to 50 or whatever, because you don't know the pattern of variation that's possible based on that mark record. Yeah, it has the same title page, so it's been encoded by a librarian as being a copy of this 1857 edition of that. Same title, same author, same date of publication, same publisher. But within that could be all sorts of variation. And you, then the question is, well, what, how much of that can we afford to preserve? How, how healthy of an ecosystem of information of books are we, uh, are, is, how much of that is a luxury and how much of that do we need? That is where you have to you know, begin to have discussions about priorities. Um. So yeah, thanks so much for this talk. It was fascinating. I, I did come in curious, but certainly not thinking this would be applicable or, or I'd feel moved by it, but it was actually, it was, it was great. Really, thanks. it kind of brought up a lot of thoughts for me. So I think I have two um, questions, and I think they're related. But uh, so I'm wondering if your observation about, or, or argument really, about digital um, copies you know, being surrogates and then replacing um, the physical copies it doesn't also have uh, maybe a dangerous, but but uh, at least a flip side, a, a reverse to it, which is that uh, that the digital text in this binary would be seen as merely a, an impoverished sort of simulacra of a more material and more real original, and and that would almost seem to play into the the discourse, I guess, of, of people who are digitizing stuff, which is that they just want to get the facts, they just want to reduce the material to its ones and zeros and, and display it as sort of unmediated fact. And I was just struck by the, uh, for example, this, this, the Google book scan of the, of the, the, hand. the finger, the hand, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if, if we shouldn't also, um, or if we shouldn't be wary of, of, of distinguishing too hard between you know, digital digital copies are not text, or cannot be used as text, or cannot you know marginalia or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's the, that's one question, and then the other was actually I just thought of this when you were thinking of when you were mentioning student uh, notes, and, and how do we how does one determine which markings are important, which are not? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and is that important? Because obviously going through we're, we're irritated when we go through whether it's a 19th century text or a 20th century text that there are student markings and underlines that. Yeah. And so it's interesting that you chose the sentimental ones because that is that, that is the most moving. Right, right. No, you have, both your questions are about sort of the ongoing history of readerly intervention and remediation of these texts. That is, the Google scan with the hand is in some ways just as interesting as Ruthie Whitehead's hand. That is, it's just a different moment, right? It, re it records another moment in the sort of history of the reproduction of this of this text of that particular copy. I'm not sure which copy Google, you know, you know Google. Whatever, that's not the UVA copy, it probably is the Michigan copy or something like that. So there's that, and there's also, yeah, that people often say that, um, well, what about, why, why don't you care about student marginality? They're just as interesting, just because they're more recent doesn't mean that, that why should what you know, some housewife wrote in 1850 be more interesting than what I wrote yesterday? Um, I'm a person too. Um, and I mean, to that I can only say I'm a student of 19th century. You know, I, I think it's probably true. I mean, I, I, and certainly if, I, would, I would love it if some postmodern scholar, a scholar of digital media, or of current reading practices said, yes, we do want to preserve that um, because that is you know, relevant to, to some sort of you know, history of academy or history of reading. I mean, there's no question. Um, but just centered where I am, um, the 19th century stuff speaks to me and feels more sort of fragile and evanescent, evanescent in the way. I feel, I feel like anyone who works on 20, late 20th or, or 21st century history is going to be drowning in 
in data, in a sense, and they're not as hungry for it maybe as we are in the 19th century, where actually evidence of everyday reading practices is kind of hard to come by. And my sense now is that this is actually the great archive of the history of everyday reading, and it's been hiding in plain sight all along, and we just never knew it was there. Um, it, I mean, we, we, we sort of knew it, but, but in a certain way, to, if you can make that case, and I'm just at the beginning now, again, I've looked where the light was good locally in the library where I sit, um, but if people heard this talk and were inspired, to go duplicate the experiment and say, well, let me look at all the Hemmonses of mine. I mean, you wouldn't have to do Hemmons, you could do whatever. Um, just sort of, these sort of fell to hand. I mean, and then I began to look more systematically going through the poet, mostly through books of poems, because I assumed those would be the ones that held, because I was pursuing a, a sentimental track. And I figured, well, I mean, there's all sorts of books. You, know, you could have history books, you could have travel books, you could have anything um, when, to look for marginality, but I had to kind of draw some boundaries around it. Um, so, I mean, those points are well taken. I think all, both student markings and Google scanning is all part of the ongoing sort of history of media that probably is, is relevant. I mean, it certainly is relevant to the history of these books and their reception. Um, it's just for me, I'm drawing, kind of draw, trying to draw a boundary around it, a disciplinary boundary around it. Yes. And given that many of these books probably are going to disappear, um, do you think there's a possible way to come from another direction and use the digital environment to preserve some of this, some of the bindings, some of the typography, some yes. of the marginalia with yeah. like tagging or things like that. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, obviously I didn't bring any of the books with me. I brought digital scans with them. I mean, all you saw are pictures, right? <laughs> and some, I used to cart, so I, I've given this talk about five times to different places, and I, sometimes I would bring a book with me, um, but it, I was like, this is hard on the book. You know, it's actually, because they're very fragile. And I was like, why, they don't, people don't need to see me brandish a 19th century volume. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but it, it, there is a way that um, you can you can make these things sort of visible or parts of them visible through digital technologies. You're always leaving stuff out, of course. I mean, because scan, scanning a book is um, a deeply editorial act. As much as much as you try to be transparent, you have to make all sorts of decisions that affect what you're capturing and what you aren't. Just to, down to the very basic structures: Do you photograph openings or pages? Bindings. Four edge, top edge, all of that, is that relevant? Well, no, you didn't. That's just the beginning. That's just the outside. In a sense, that's just the physical structures. Then there's all sorts of things. You know, so if, if you ever set yourself a task, um, particularly with a large set of data, so one book you might be able to make decisions about, but what if you have an at scale project where you have 100 books, all in a slightly different format? Some are three volumes, some are large elephant folios, some are a little tiny. And you're like, okay, I need a system that's going to work for all of these. And so you end up having to discard certain, you can't lovingly. You can't spend ten weeks on each book, you know. I mean, so you have to have some kind of modeling or sampling or representative kind of exercise, and it's in that that um, it essentially works against the preservation aspect of this. But I think you're right, and so it's it's better than nothing. Um, that is to take as, to take to try to if stuff is going away to try to grab it with cameras as much as we can before it is in the dumpster. But it's better than nothing. But I don't want to I don't want to hold out to the policymakers digitization as you know, a total answer to this problem because in a certain way, my point is that the physical structures are, are evidentiary in a way that there's, there's stuff there that we can't, can't see or know or capture. I had another question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was wondering, and this might just be kind of academic provincialism on my part, um, but in, you know, in our department at least, we have a lot of great Renaissance scholars who work on the history of the book. Yes. Um, but listening to your talk, I was reminded of of moments in novels, I, you know, I work on 19th century literature, and I think, you know, like in the middle of the floss when the father writes in the Bible, or like in the beginning of Wuthering Heights, and you know, the air swung with Kathy, is like Kathy this, Kathy that. And so certainly it's there, yeah. you know, and we're told in the narratives we read that this was a practice. And I've read a bit about, you know, like kind of the return to the common reader, that book about mass literacy, like I've read a, but, but I haven't really, I don't know, I've never really encountered much in terms of Victorian textual history. And I was wondering why, why you think that is, what, because there is so much in, why, is it because, just because when things are older, you, you feel like you go to that aspect, the Well, that's part of it, I mean, part quickly. of it is, an, yeah, as a, as a history of a lot of the way libraries work, um, I think what you're talking about, that is, People, rare book rooms, so if something makes it into a rare book room, it's going to be lovingly described and curated. It's mm -hmm. easy to find. And so people, it sort of gathers information about it. And the things in the circulating collections tend to be viewed as replaceable. And then there's no finding aids. There's no, you know, in terms of provenance, there's no, not even a list of UVA about whose books these are. You have to open each one and look at the book plate. It used to be recorded. It was on the card catalog, but when they went digital, they didn't, they didn't 
keep that field because oh my god, who cares anymore? You know, who gave us this book? That's ridiculous. So, um, so it's, there's an interesting divide between things that are rare, that is everything sort of before 1800 that get a kind of special treatment if it's retained, and the stuff that's in this kind of age, particularly the age of industrial printing, where it's assumed to be all the same and one copy is as good as another, et cetera, et cetera. So that that's just a kind of art aspect of that. Um, I mean, I think there has been work done on, people are interested in Victorian reading practices, yeah. but the evidence, like where is the art, where, where do you look? So people tend to look at marginalia, let's just stick with marginalia for a while, people look at marginalia of famous persons because it's all in rare book rooms. So you know, you have cheap books, but they were written in by George Eliot or whatever. So then, okay, I can study that. Um, but then you're working in this weird exceptionalist mode where, you, where you're doing histories of authors writing about other books, et cetera, et cetera. It's very difficult in a sense to get back to the everyday and just to say, how did people use? You can see how people talked about their use but to actually find examples. So in a certain way, you know, I'm excited about this project, but it just takes a lot of work because we don't know who these people were. You know, each one, like that whole James Slaughter, John Adamson thing, you don't want to know how long it took me to figure out who these people were. And I still don't know enough. And there's still a lot more. I need to actually go to DC and look at the ship's list of ship's passengers to Liberia in 1900 to figure out was John Adamson on one of those ships to Liberia in July or the summer of 1900, but that's a lot of work. And I could be wrong. That is, it might not be John Adamson at all. His name's in the book, but she never calls him John. Could have been some Episcopal, pri Episcopal priest who she met you know, at the infirmary when she was a patient there, and who knows? John Adamson is just a, a canard, so, you know. But how much of my life um, can I devote to any one particular case? That one I'm willing to because it's such a fascinating object. But then all those other ones, you know, all those ones that I flipped by, Who's going to do that work? This is, could be something that you got undergrads to do. I mean, it might be something if you got people excited, you could get people to research. But you'd have to like have some payoff, intellectual payoff at the end. You don't want people banging their head against the wall and figuring out that this is just some banal, you know, inscription of one kind or another. So those are some of the challenges. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I had a question about how you trust versus Google Books. Mm -hmm. So I, I. I guess, I, I mean, I always use Google Books. I never use Hockey Trust. Right. Um, but I, I guess, what do you consider to be? I, I haven't really even what's formulated the this basically? question. Well, what's the difference, I guess? You know, one is a for profit company, one's a corporation, the other one's yeah. non profit. Right. Um, how are they positioned against each other? I mean, are they going after kind of the same stacks of books? And what do you think are kind of be kind of the long term consequences of? perhaps like a non-profit digitization versus like a corporate digitization. Yeah, that's why Hobby Trust was started because there was this fear that Google was monopolizing the cultural record. And so libraries, if they were smart, when they signed the agreement that Google could scan their collections, they also said, yes, and we can have a copy to, for our own use as well. And then the libraries who signed that got all got together and said, let's put these in one pot. And so we have a shadow or a mirror archive for the things that Google has. And to that, we can add our own digitized collections, so things that Google didn't bother with. So Hobby Trust theoretically is going to be a richer acad academic resource because it's going to be curated by librarians, it's going to be added to over time, and it's going to be about, made by people who care about books. Google isn't, doesn't care, I, I mean I love Google, I use it all the time, but they're not doing this because they care about books, they're doing it because they want to improve their search algorithm. And the more information they have in there, the better they're able to hone in on what exactly it is you want. That's their product. And so the books were a quick way to kind of get a lot of data in there and to get people using. So that's really, and so they basically, recently there's been a news that they are slowing down their scanning. That they have gotten all the low hanging fruit. Everything else is gonna be expensive. And they're kind of like, why are we doing this? You know, uh, this is everything else. So that's what I've heard. It's not been confirmed by Google, but if you talk to librarians, they say, yeah, that they're not taking as many books as they have. Maybe because they've sort of, you know, got the, the basic 20, the 20 million easy ones they've got. And there's 100 million more out there, but they're going to be a lot harder to get. Um, so we'll see. It'll be an interesting story to follow. But Hobby Trust, I guess, would be the one on our side, the side of the angels, that is academic <laughs> research libraries coming together, and they want to aid research into the materials. They want to build interfaces. But in a certain way, they scare me more because uh, in, in, if I'm in this mood, because they are our friend. They're our frenemies. Uh, that is, they, they want to help us. They want to make research libraries stronger. They want to um, empower the humanities. They, all the things they say, they want to preserve this. They want to preserve the historical record. Google is easy to demonize because they're Google and everyone likes to make fun of them. They're sort of corporate and faceless. But Body Trust is, is comprised of people in academia and heads of academic libraries. Um, and I think, I, mean, I think it's a good thing. But it's the downstream effects that, that LCLC reports say, oh, now that we've got this, not only is it awesome, but now we don't need the books anymore. And that's the step I'm trying to say, well, hold on a second. Um, let's talk about why we still might need them. 
Sorry, <laughs> I'm still thinking about the differences or not differences or whatever implication between digital and analog text. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you think that um, if, if in fact the, it's, it's the digitization process that has made us less uh, careful or less uh, treat, treat these books with less care, or it's in fact the industrial process themselves that is sort of like, so they, they were already treated as yes. sort of if ephemeral objects yeah. or these uh, um, easily replaceable objects. That's right. They, they, I mean, most of the books that I'm talking about here were uh, mass produced, essentially, and that's why they've never been really given much love by the bibliographers or by, by anybody, um, because they're assumed to be printed from stereotype plates, therefore all identical, meant to be, take advantage of the latest technology to produce sameness as quickly, you know, as much right. as possible. Um, in, and that was certainly more true. If you look at an 18th century book, you know, if you look at a 1750 book and an 1850 book, you're going to see a lot more variation in the 1750 book among copies than you are in the 1850 book on average, um, particularly at the point of production. But the patterns of the evidence of use, that is the aftermarket, you know, the passage of these things, the way that they the process, that process has continued, that, it, you know, if you work in the 19th century, it still remains interesting and, and relevant. Even if the books themselves came off the press looking identical, that is the sheets were identical because they were printed from the same stereotype plates. Okay, but how about, a, how about assembled? How about color? How about the binding? How about the, how did it get, how was it used? Marginalia, whatever, all the different ways that it might reflect um, its, its kind of being in, in time. So, that, but that doesn't completely, you had another nuance to the question. I don't feel like I completely answered. Well, I'm just wondering if, I, I was more, I'm still trying to think about if, if the digital, if a digital copy of a book uh, can in some way still be thought of as a, I don't know, as a text or, or, yeah. if, or if there's a real rush, I guess, if, if, if we're mistaken or, or too quick to think about a rupture, a, a real difference binary between an analog text and a digital text. And, yeah. yeah, the reason, the reason I do, I, because they, these were born analog, mm -hmm. that is they, so let's take this book, that's probably Tennyson, um, you know, probably, I don't know, 5,000 copies were printed. And so there were a finite number of them in the world, and each one had its own history, and there's a certain number of them left, et cetera, et cetera. So you can scan one of you can pick one and say, I'm going to scan this as representative of that print run, and we're all going to look at this one uh, because that's or you know because that's the one that got selected for whatever reason, convenience, it was in good shape, it fit on the scanner, the library was producing it. You know, it, it wasn't chosen as a Google has no bibliographers on staff. They pick they went to libraries in a kind of random order. They took whatever they wanted, and then they went to the next library. And whatever that library didn't have, they cherry picked the remainder. They went to the next library, cherry picked the remainder. They did not scan entire library collections. So they, they try to develop a single copy theory. They don't want to duplicate themselves. So if it's the same book, they don't want it. So that's why they, it's, not, it's hard, difficult for them because they can't just take a whole stack and beat it through a scan. They have to pick the ones that fill out the collection. So using that single copy logic to represent an entire print run is the problem for me. That's the cleavage because you're, you're, you're essentially forcing many eyes on one and saying that's the book. But of course, for me, the book is a much more complicated system um, of, of copies and use and history, and, you know what I mean? So that so looking at one is a kind of very partial slice of an entire um, history that began at the moment of say, well, who knows where, you know, setting in type or maybe even earlier, whatever, and has and sort of ongoing the history of these books and where they are now, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that relying on the digital, the digital surrogate for me is a window, on, a very small little narrow window onto a world that is still out there, but possibly is going to be increasingly harder to map when you get back in touch with it. Um, so where does Blake fit into this? Um, I mean, <laughs> yes. does this, I guess, does this talk make him like the sort of prophetic genius who <laughs> foresaw the problem? Who, who produced who produced rare books basically you know yeah, who, yeah I mean that, that that's the way out Morris too I suppose you know if you if every book you produce is instantly rare um, you sort of resist the market um, then you give up contemporary readership as Blake did but you ensure uh, you know complete uh, archival you know photographs of every copy that you and multiple you know. images right they yes. have, like all of his copies right. that's right. Yeah, because it can be done because it's containable in a sense. And Blake, in a certain way, I see as the la is he's the, he's the conclusion to that 18th history of the 18th century book in a sense. I mean, he, he hasn't quite. He's still working in a lot of those modes of. Very, his books are like 18th century hand set books more than they are like these 1850 Hemmingses um, that stereotype plates and things like that. Even though he's using plates, there's a way that that modification is 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 central to the process. So, yeah. It is, a, it is an economic, I mean, it's based in, as you say, like mass production 
and middle class readership. And that's why these readers are interesting. I mean, no, th these are unsponsored things, right? They're cheap, they always were cheap. They're read by everyday people. They are marked in everyday ways. And there's a sense that it's just sort of too much, it's kind of too much and too um, middle brow to pay much attention to it. And it connects to the literature, because Hemmings, right, has that problem. Um, Longfellow has that problem. The popular poets, the ones that meant something to 19th century readers in a really deep personal way, and you can see it happening here, are cheaply sentimental, in the same way that their books were cheap. But there's a way that the patterns of the academy and the patterns of librarianship obviously went hand in hand from the beginning. What they collected was what the professors wanted. That's how the modern research library got started, and it's gone on from there. Now, this stuff has come in because in the middle of the 20th century, Academic li research libraries in America were rewarded for having large collections. The more volumes you had, the higher you ranked in the rankings of greatness in of libraries. So right around 1940, after the Second World War, libraries were like, "Give us everything." They said that to a lot, and because we, we want to up our numbers, we want 10, you know, we want two million books, we want two and a half million, we want to beat Michigan, we want to beat whatever. So they just took all the stuff. They didn't, they didn't bother really to sort it or even really to look through it very well. They just sort of slapped it on the shelves and added it to the collection. They cataloged it, um, but that was about it. And, and as you can see from all that stuff that's stuck in them, letters, poems, hair, no one's ever opened these books. They've been there since the, since the 50s. I mean, if they have, they didn't open them very much because that stuff would have fallen right out. So there's, so there's this weird accident of the building of library collections in the United States anywhere that has left us with this archive of stuff that essentially is unsponsored and it continues to be so. And it may be that that will always be its case and it's going to come and go, that is, it's had its moment. Um, but we've, it's suddenly become too much of a luxury to preserve it anymore because it was never really relevant to the mission of the university in the first place. I'm just trying to put my foot in the door uh, before that all happens, which seems to have an inexorable logic, and I've certainly had people say, you're tilting at windmills, this is over, it's not even a fight anymore. Um, but I feel like, well, I mean, if I don't say it, who is gonna say it? I, I, I'm. A digital person, so I can say it, that is, I'm not a curmudgeon. People don't think, oh, he's just a Luddite curmudgeon. I mean, I can be that way, but I also know a lot about the digital, at least enough to be dangerous and enough to come back to people who say, well, yes, but the digital will save us. And I'll say, ah, yes, but yeah. So I, I feel like I'm empowered, in a sense, to, to, to say these things, whether it's going to have any effect or not. Um, but I'd be interested, particularly, in hearing from you guys about like, just the strategy of appeal, strategies of appeal. Like I said, the sentimental. I mean, a couple people said this is moving. That's good. I was going for that. But um, there's a way, like, how, what are the kinds of arguments that you think might have um, an edge uh, with policymakers? Like, how are we going to make the case for this stuff? And my sense is it ultimately has to come back to intellectual work, trying to show how this, this, these variations in whatever, use, book, making, uh, can be brought to bear on what we do as literary historians or as literary critics or just as historians or whatever, history of reading. But there's gotta be some disciplinary involvement. It can't simply be fun things I found in the stacks. <laughs> because that is going up. There's a website called Forgotten Bookmarks. You, it, you should check out if you like this. It's this guy, he's a used book dealer, and every day he posts a picture of something he found in an old book that somebody donated or sold to him or whatever. That's all sorts of interesting stuff. Everything like, so he'll have stuff that was you know, little notes that were written yesterday down to like letters from the 1750s that had happened. You know, so yes, it's a total range of stuff. It's, it's a cabinet of curiosities, essentially. Um, and it's fascinating to look through, but it doesn't really do what we need to do, which is to show how the presence of these kinds of marks, or maybe not marks, even something about the variation of the printed record is worth preserving for, us, for our own work, it's necessary. This is our lab, you know, we need to make the kind of arguments this is necessary for what we do. Maybe not for all of us, but that somehow it has to be articulated that this is crucial to teaching our students and to, to pursuing our own research agendas in the disciplines. Um, we've got time for one more question. I've got a question then. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, think it's <laughs> I apologize if I missed this at the beginning, but I'm curious a little bit about you know your process about how you sort of maybe what was the first thing you found that, that started you on this? And then mm -hmm. you know, even just looking at this picture, you know, what was your process in going to you know, the UVA stacks and, and you know, getting this stuff? Was it you? Was it Greg? Yeah, it was, it was actually, I was teaching a class, um, it was called Poetry in the Age of Industrial Printing, and just, we were gonna do Hemmings. So I said, I'll tell you what, why don't everyone just go in the stacks and bring in a 19th century copy of Hemmings? Because I knew we had a bunch in there. Did everyone just bring one? Because I just kind of random dip of the bucket into the stream. Let's see what kinds of forms and formats she was coming in because I, that would be an interesting way to start. Um, so they did that, and one of them was the 
the Ellen Miners, the Ellen Miner. And I didn't really think much of it at the time. I was like, oh, okay, this, yeah, the, there's a poem in the back, whatever. And the more I thought about it, I was like, um, I'm just going to do a little genealogical digging, see if anybody Mary was. And then I, found, you know, then, then it clicked. I was like, oh, this is this is something different. This is not just someone because a lot of people will commonplace in books of poems. They will write in other poems. They will copy, you know, favorite Hemans poems that aren't in there or something like that. But this is like an original composition. And, I, and it was then I was like, so I found that and I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. It's kind of moving. Why don't I look at the other Hemans? And then the Charlotte Cochran came up almost right after. So the, the with her son William Gordon. I was like, oh my god, I'm on to something. Like, I barely started looking, and I've already found two that are almost you know, the same phenomena. So I wrote a piece on Hemans and sentimental reading practices, and it wasn't at all about library policy. It was just about, look at this interesting you know, way that Hemans was being used, as a, 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 and it has to do with gender, and Hemans' place as a domestic writer, and all this stuff. Um, but, and then the Longfellow book somehow came to hand. I think I was just wandering around the stacks going, wow, I wish I would find more. I, I, so, and that one just literally jumped in my head. I don't know why I was even looking at Longfellow. I can't remember now. But, but anyway, those, in certain ways, those were the best ones that I found. Because then after that, I was like, OK, I, this is ridiculous. This, this is like the mother load. I've, only, I've dug twice, and I've hit gold you know, three times. And so I'm going to systematically start walking the stacks. Just when I have a free hour, I'll go through the A's and pull. Start just with the poems. And that's when I began to develop this kind of collection. So I have like you know a couple hundred books that have stuff in them. But it's widely varying. Once you begin to do that, it's, it, it was it was you know all sorts of all that stuff you saw on the screen and more. I have all these examples. But then now I'm kind of like, well, what do I what do I do with all these? Um, and it, it's kind of easier to have it was almost easier to have a tighter focus. I'm just going to look at one author and see how her books were used. But um, it would be better to really go around to the libraries of the world and look at all the Hemmingses, for example, and then you can do something with that. So it is interesting sort of how to slice and dice the project. And then finally, this semester, I got an RA, so I said, guess what, Emma? You're going to walk the stacks and pull all books and have marks in them and bring them to me and we'll have a conversation about each one. So she was fine with that because she had worked in a rare books, for a rare books dealer before, so she was very used to handling books. So we found a lot more interesting things. But now it's just sort of piling up, and I'm like, well, great, now what do I do? Because as I say, each one of them takes a lot of work. To figure out exactly what's going on there, it's one thing to flash them by you, but if you actually want to say, okay, what's going on there? I have a, and there are some interesting examples. I have four or five that are almost as evocative as the ones that I've shown you here, and it's just a matter of, okay, what's the best way to pursue this agenda? Am I done? That is, did I just dip a bucket? I got enough. I made the point. It's more evocative not to do some kind of statistically significant sample, or would it be better to say, okay, I'm going to write a book on this. I'm going to go to, you know, five different university libraries and do a kind of report on what's on the shelves of five different libraries, do a library-based kind of thing. Here's UVA. Because my, my argument is that these are coherent, semi-coherent collections because of their institutional history. You could say, well, look, all these books are going to be at the accession. They'll be on the rare book market or the used book market. They'll still be out there. I mean, some of them will be dumpstered because they're in bad shape. But, still, but it's something about the coherence of the collection. So as you begin looking for um, these things, you begin multiple copies of this multiple books owned by the same person because their whole collection was there. So I have other books by Helen Miner now. I have a bunch of books by Marion Trowbridge because she, and she was very feisty, the one with the trace the hand, she was Byron with a bad man, that's her too. She was always sort of, sort of making. So you begin to get a sense of personalities. And so that's, there's a kind of um, coherence to them as they sit on the shelves of the library, so you might go about it that way. But I, yeah, I'd be interested in suggestions about sort of where to go with this. And again, I don't want people to get distracted with the marginalia too much. That is, it's ultimately not about marginalia. So that's just a, it's a very visible example of, the, of what I'm trying to talk about, sort of the book as, you know, scene of encounter, evidence of use, variation among copies, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thank you so much for this. This was great. All right, thanks, you guys. This was great. Thank you.